presentation together on Wednesday. Um, and it's titled, What is Ireland's Bank Debt and What Can Be Done About It? And if you um, paid close attention to the uh, uh, morning radio shows and uh, uh, internet news coverage, you might think that uh, this is now an, uh, an out-of-date presentation because, um, to coin a phrase, I have in my hand a piece of paper um, that uh, potentially, supposedly, is uh, going to lead to uh, banking debt peace in our time. Um, in truth, this morning's statement about Ireland merely says that uh, the Eurogroup will examine the situation of the Irish financial sector with the view of further improving the sustainability of blah, blah, blah. So, um, so it's a commitment to examine. Um, what are they going to examine? Well, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, the 63 billion total is 30.7 billion related to promissory notes. It is uh, 20.7 billion, which is money that came from the National Pension Reserve Fund uh, to acquire stakes in AIB and Bank of Ireland. Then there's an additional 11.4 billion that's been spent on, on AIB, IBRC, and Irish Life and Permanent. And, you know, it's, it's, you can we talk about Ireland's bank debt. You can say, okay, we had money in the National Pension Reserve Fund. And if we hadn't put it into AIB and Bank of Ireland, we could have used that to finance budget deficits and we wouldn't have had to borrow money. That's fine, but there is no specific issue of Irish sovereign debt. There is no specific part of Ireland's EU or IMF debt that is sort of earmarked and has a little stamp on it that says, this is the bank debt. Right? So basically what we have is the promissory notes, which clearly is bank-related debt. And then we have the other stuff, which is we have acquired assets, and there's a question about what those assets are worth uh, at this point. So I'm just going to divide my comments into these two bits and start with what we call the, the living banks, uh, AIB, Bank of Ireland, uh, and Irish Life and Permanent. The government has spent $25.4 in acquiring AIB uh, and part of Bank of Ireland. Now, those investments are currently held uh, by the National Pension Reserve Fund, and they are valued... Uh, by the National Pension Reserve Fund, most recently at, at 9.4 billion. So these have not been great investments uh, uh, for the state. Um, now, what are they really worth? Uh, most of that 9.4 billion represents uh, the NPRS valuation of, of, of its stake in AIB. Uh, book value of, of the equity in AIB is, is, is 14.6 billion. Um, but the bank has very weak uh, operating profits, it has ongoing loan loss write downs and, and potentially will need further recapitalization if mortgages and commercial property and other loans that they have uh, end up moving in line with, as it looks like they will, the central bank's sort of stress scenarios that were done last year. So, in, in my judgment, that 9.4 billion uh, uh, valuation looks quite optimistic relative to what anybody in the market would pay to acquire AIB and to acquire part of Bank of Ireland. Uh, then there's Irish Life and Permanent. That's not held by the National Pension Reserve Fund. We don't know what anybody thinks it's worth. It's not worth a whole lot, I'll tell you that. Um, Irish Life and Permanent is a sort of basket case kind of institution. It is a combination of a reasonably functional uh, insurance element and a dysfunctional uh, banking element. It has about 34 billion in mortgage loans, unfortunately, uh, fortunately if you've got one, uh, 23 billion of them uh, are tracker mortgages that are sort of ongoing loss-making vehicles relative to the, what, what, what a reasonable market cost of funds would be to a bank like this. Uh, and it has serious funding problems. It, it owes nearly as much to central banks as it has by way of, of, of deposits. There have been various discussions about what, th what could be done to restore Irish life and permanent to some kind of viability. Um, the idea of perhaps carving out the trackers from it and creating some sort of special vehicle. But ultimately, that's a, that's a form of subsidy from Europe to provide this bank with cheap funding for a long time as it runs down. In, in terms of market value, the, the bank would have, I've written here, limited market value. Um, now, why does this stuff matter? Well, I, I, I wrote here on Wednesday that, that a European bank resolution scheme is part of uh, Mr. Van Rompuy's uh, genuine EMU proposal, but I think we can start to say today it's one step closer to reality. Um, 
But we don't have details yet on how something like this would work. Now, how might it work? Uh, John referred before to the idea that if that European banks should be allowed to fail, and that it's a business, and that bank creditors should be a, should be on the loss when you know on the hook for losses when they they, they make bad investments, and. I think there's now pretty widespread agreement throughout Europe that the Irish model, as was practiced here, you know, we could talk about whether the government made good decisions or not in the past few years. One decision they made that was a particularly bad decision was the bank guarantee. Um, it's pretty widespread, there's pretty widespread agreement that that is not a sustainable model for Europe, right? that the European taxpayer should not be on the hook. So my suspicion is that if the ESM is allowed to go in and, and, and recapitalize banks, uh, that this goes hand in hand with the proposal for a supervisory authority. That means that all of these banks that are going to get investments are going to be analyzed according to a sort of common methodology, and that the ESM is not going to be set up as an institution to just walk in and lose money by putting money into dead banks, putting money into insolvent banks. And I don't think anyone in Ireland should, should hope that the European authorities do that. So, so, but from our perspective, that, that, that suggests a potential problem. If ESM is set up to go in and make investments and purchase shares in banks at market price and not lose money for European taxpayers, to get the risk associated with those investments off, let's say, the Spanish balance sheet, but not to go in willy-nilly losing money, uh, then we have a problem in terms of our, let's say, the 25 billion we spent on AIB and Bank of Ireland. Now. We would love if the man from Europe uh, arrived in later this year and offered us 25 billion for AIB and Bank of Ireland, right? We'd bite his hand off. We'd say, yeah, we, we recap those banks for 25 billion, and we'd like the 25 billion back, please. But I suspect ESM is not going to be set up that way. And if you want the European taxpayers to give us back all of our money that we put into those institutions, then you're going to need some sort of separate deal uh, and a separate deal that explicitly uh, involves a, 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 an, a, an agreement to take on losses that we have already taken on and spread them across the European taxpayer. And I suspect that that's not how ESM at least is going to be set up. Uh, so I'm not saying it can't happen, but it would require a level of negotiation well over and above simply saying, yeah, Spanish are getting banks recapped. We want that too. Um, you could argue there's some disadvantages if we end up selling at a relatively you know, low price. Let's suppose, suppose we've got the, the NPRF valuation of 9.6 billion. You could say, well, maybe we're selling at a fire sale. Um, we're losing strategic control over, over these important national assets. You would find that AIB uh, and its policy towards people in mortgage arrears, Irish Life and Permanent, their policy towards people in mortgage arrears is not being made by people who uh, 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 work in, in, in Marion Street, but by people who work in Frankfurt and Brussels. Uh, I think probably on balance that might be a good thing. But, but there are potential disadvantages uh, to, to, to selling off these institutions. I think it's outweighed by the advantages. Um, any funds that are received can be used to pay off debt, or if this is what you want to do, potentially to fund productive capital programs. It's up to the government to decide what to do with the money. Um, Probably more importantly, it reduces f further uncertainty in relation to the state balance sheet, uh, in relation to if these banks require further bank recap, further recapitalization, well then that's going to be the European taxpayers' issue and, and not ours. And I think that's removing that sort of tail risk uncertainty as to what happens if the economy gets in a downward cycle and then the banks need recapitalization and then we have to spend more money on the banks and so on. That, that, is, that is cut off. Um, there's also the question of, uh, whether or not European control of these institutions and a remaking of them in a way to make them marketable and functioning institutions could end up uh, uh, being to the wider benefit of the economy in the sense that if, if, if you could come up with a vehicle that removes, let's say, the tracker mortgages from AIB and Irish Life and Permanent, they could be very quickly sort of right-sized in a sense and, and, and the sort of ongoing deleveraging process could possibly be ended and they could start lending into the Irish economy again in a normal way, which they're certainly not doing now. So I think there, there are advantages to that kind of, those kinds of deal. Uh, which brings us to the dead bank. Uh, the issues at the dead bank are really quite different. Um, we own the dead bank, for sure, 
um, just like we own AIB, but there's very little point in talking about the, the value of the IBRC, the equity of the IBRC. Nominally, the bank actually has some <coughs> equity of, of, of three billion, um, but you know that's one year's promissory note payments. That's not anything to get too excited about. Um, the real problem is looking at its balance sheet. This is a bank that basically doesn't have any depositors anymore, more or less no depositors. There's a lot of fuss about, about the various bondholders that it owes money to. Most of them got their money. There's very few debt securities left. This 5.4 billion is the balance sheet at the end of 2011. Lots of those guys have been paid off. We've given guarantees to the rest. Basically, this is an institution who's, whose primary reason for existence now is to pay back 40 billion in debts that it owes to the Irish Central Bank in the form of emergency liquidity assistance. Uh, and that's the purpose, essentially, of the promissory notes. Um, w without the promissory notes, if, the, if, if there were no promissory notes, the, the, the ELA uh, uh, debts couldn't be repaid, but everything else could. So effectively, that's what they're there for. Um, and this whole schedule that's been come up with for the promissory notes, this 3.1 billion a year until 2020, and then after that, effectively, that's a repayment schedule for emergency liquidity assistance. Um, so if you want to get into the small details of this arrangement, it, it, can, it can get very, very complicated. But the, the, the simple summary of it is basically the Irish government has agreed to provide promissory note payments to the IBRC. The IBRC owes ELA to the Central Bank of Ireland. Central Bank of Ireland takes the ELA, and basically the money that they created when they went and made loans to uh, Anglo uh, in the first place basically is taken out of circulation. There's no great upside uh, for us in, in that repayment. Lots of people uh, who have analyzed this have come up with the very clever idea of we should just write off the ELA. Right? Patrick Honohan should call up the government and say, it's okay guys, don't pay back. Um, well, Patrick's a very smart man and if it was possible, I think he would have done that. Um, unfortunately, the issuance of ELA is something that is uh, determined, has to be done in agreement with the ECB Governing Council. And the ECB Governing Council views any sort of deferral or, op or open-ended sort of uh, repayment or cancellation of ELA as, as illegal, right? and that it breaks the monetary financing uh, prohibition. The government has also provided various legal commitments that this ELA debts, these ELA debts would be repaid, separate from the promissory notes. Ultimately, what it comes down to is to simply write this thing off would be illegal under uh, European law. Um, most likely, what would end up happening would be the European Central Bank would end up uh, removing the Irish banks from its, uh, uh, its programs. There would be no more lending from Europe. It would probably trigger a massive demand for repayment. Uh, and effectively, it is a decision. It would be a decision to decide to have a national default. Now, people can talk about that, but I mean, that's basically what we're talking about. So within the set of, of, of options that are available to us that probably make sense, I don't think simply just saying we're not going to repay the ELA uh, actually works. My preference is to restructure the promissory notes in a way that allows the bank to work through its current assets that it has and use it to pay off the bondholders that it owes money to, to pay off the ECB, to pay off all its creditors, and then at some point in a few years' time, we can find out, okay, how much do they have uh, uh, left in debts, in ELA debts, and we can, start, we can start repaying that and we can do it very, very slowly. And this is not something that would require political approval. This simply requires the ECB Governing Council to do their bit and accept uh, that part of the improving the sustainability of the so-called well-performing Irish Adjustment Program that the the, the, the summit statement refers to uh, is, is, is something that the ECB can contribute to and contribute to use with a relatively simple decision. Uh, the ECB, of course, doesn't like ELA. Uh, it doesn't fit with its standard procedures. It's by definition a loan that is not against the standard euro system collateral. Um, and they would like to see ELA programs across Europe disappear. So the ECB would prefer something like the Ireland gets a big loan from the ESM to pay off ELA. So let's say we get a 30-year loan from the ESM, pay off the, 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 the ELA loans, and, and, and then we can gradually pay back the ESM. 
That's not my favorite proposal here. Um, it, the underlying interest rate on, on, on loans from the SM will be higher than the effective cost of the state of the current uh, ELA arrangement. Um, it turns ELA debt um, into official debt that is owed to uh, this ESM body requires political appro approval throughout Europe to get such a loan. It would be widely seen as a second bailout for Ireland, even if in Ireland it would just be viewed as swapping one type of debt for another. Um, and at this point, with things going the way they're going, we have to, 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 to remember that in extreme scenarios, such as a Euro breakup scenario, this will be official debt that will be almost equivalent to owing money to the IMF. Whereas outside the euro system, the Irish Central Bank could uh, come up with its own bilateral arrangement in relation to ELA. I'm not saying that that's something that's going to happen, but we need to think about the sort of uh, extreme risk scenarios. At the same time, I think still think an ESM lo loan to replace the ELA, provided there's a very long maturity loan, would still be better than the current arrangement. And certainly something should be put in place before uh, next March 31st and a long time before next March 31st, and we can avoid the fiasco uh, that happened this year. So some concluding thoughts. There's absolutely no doubt that Ireland was placed under pretty severe EU pressure to take on large amounts of bank-related debt. Now here I'm not really referring to the September 2008 agreement. We did that on our own. But at subsequent points, in particular in the run-up to and after the September 2010, uh, EU IMF agreement, there was severe pressure placed by the EU and in particular the ECB to have Ireland take on large amounts of bank related debt. Now today, everybody in Europe pretty much agrees that this so-called Irish model for dealing with bank debt uh, doesn't work. So there is a strong moral and practical case for, for, for some form of EU assistance. Okay, and I wrote this on Wednesday and I'm happy to see on Friday that there is some mention of us. But people need to understand that to call today's statement a seismic change, uh, to call it uh, a, a deal breaker, it is getting very far ahead of ourselves. And we've been here before. Right? Gov government's statements in the run-up to the March 31st uh, promissory note payment also talked about uh, we, we've got to get a deal done and this, all sorts of things are going to happen, and, and that's not what happened. Um, the retrofitting of the Irish debt is extremely complex. It's a very sui generis kind of issue at this point. The model that is being worked out by the Europeans for dealing with bank debt is unlikely to involve wholesale losses being put on individual states uh, or being put on the, on the EU. And so uh, it's, it's really a separate sort of an issue. And I think that uh, it's going to be up to the Irish government to, to keep this case on the agenda all the time uh, and to keep working out imaginative and fair ways uh, to, to resolve this, uh, this issue. Uh, so on, uh, for good or real, this is an issue that we're going to see a lot more headlines about uh, in the coming months. And I'll leave it at that. Okay.